Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Pastors Connection, where we take a short midweek break together and rejoice in the names of God. We're deep now into the names that the Scripture gives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the name today is a name that he will always hold, but that men and women only have a limited time to take and give to him. It's a very unique name. It's a beautiful name. We know it as a name, especially at the time when we celebrate his birth uh, in the Christmas season that is on our lips, but it's a name for all eternity. The name today is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. What a name. Let's talk about it in the way we usually do. First of all, we ask the question, what does the name mean in the language and that we find it in in Scripture? And the... uh, The Greek sounds this way, basileos, basileon. And the the first word is basileos, which is the name for king in the Greek language. It was the name for any king uh, with a kingdom. Small king, great king, little kingdom, majestic kingdom. The second word is basileon, and that means kings of kings. So, So he is the king of kings. He is the king over all kings. He is the one who has the majesty over all rulership, over all time, over all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, We get our English word basilica from it. And a basilica is is the name that that is used to describe some of the the majestic uh, cathedrals around the world. Basilica really means the hall of the king. And so we know this is a name of majesty. It's a name that urges us when we come into his presence to be humbled, to worship him in awe, to be aware of his great power and authority. Basileus Basileon, the king of kings. Now, we might think of it this way. What the Bible means when it calls Jesus Christ the king of kings is that he is the greatest king with the greatest kingdom. It's it's a title of magnification of who he is above any comparable king, earthly or demonic for that matter. Very important. So it's a great and majestic title, isn't it? Our second question is, where do we find it in Scripture? Well, where we find it in Scripture tells us the human story of how to respond to the king of kings. There are two major places in the, in the New Testament where Jesus is described as the king. And they, are, they, are, they occur in two separate arrivals of Christ as king. And there are two separate outcomes in terms of how people respond. The first is in Matthew chapter 21. And it's surrounding the events that we've come to know as the events of Palm Sunday. It is also known as the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. You remember the story when he drew near to Jerusalem, entering into the final week of his ministry. He called for a donkey, and he was placed on that donkey, and he rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, and people threw their robes and palm branches at its feet and in the air and hailed him as the son of David. Well, Jesus did that to fulfill prophecy. And the prophecy is described in Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5, where the scripture says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Israel, at at that time in, in Jerusalem in Judea, Behold, your king is coming to you, there he's named, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So Jesus came as the king. Now he came humble and mounted on a beast of burden to demonstrate that he was coming humbly into the city to eventually give his life as a savior for that nation. But they were looking for a different kind of king, a majestic king, a more impressive king, who would come and immediately take them into political power and defeat the Romans, as I've told you many times. They were looking for an earthly king He was coming as a human and divine sacrifice who would solve their sins and be their savior. Well, on that day, he came to Israel and they rejected him. He went to that cross anyway. 
And the nation of Israel believed him not. But when he rose from the dead, the church age began. When he rose from the dead, his disciples began preaching Christ as a Savior King, not just for Israel, but for all the world. And from that time until this time, in this age, everyone is free to come to him as their king. Not just Jewish people, but everyone from every tribe and tongue and nation. And that's how you have come to Christ. If you're not Jewish, but you're watching me and you have come to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you are a fulfillment of that very great promise. So the first time he came, he was rejected by Israel, but now he can be accepted by the world. And when you accept Jesus Christ today, even though the world is still wrapped in sin and evil is still roaring, he has not yet returned as a physical king, but he has come into your heart as a spiritual king. And you open your heart to him and you bow your life to him and he becomes the ruler of your life and the lives of countless others around the world through the ages who are now part of the invisible kingdom of the king. And when we walk with him in humility and trust, we honor the king and his rule is fulfilled in our lives and through our lives. If you've come to Jesus, you're a member of the king, kingdom, kingdom rather, and you're living for the king. Now, there is another time when Jesus is described as king that is yet future. And it is a time when the time will depart and be over for people to claim him as king. Remember I said the name king of kings is a name Jesus will always hold, but there's only a limited amount of time for people to come and acknowledge him as king. And that time will have come to an end in Revelation 19. The scripture says in Revelation 19.11, John saw a vision of the future when Jesus comes back visibly and physically to planet earth, to judge those who've never received him, to, to, to judge sin, and to begin to set up his visible kingdom. And John said, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, no longer a humble donkey and a beast of burden, but a white horse of a conquering king. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Look down now with, with me to verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He'll be coming back again, this time as the final authority. This time, with no more time left to acknowledge him as the King of Kings, all who have failed to do that up to that time will be led away in judgment. So, the final judgment awaits those who have never bowed the knee to Jesus. They'll no longer have a chance to honor him. They will only have a chance to experience his wrath. Now, you would say, wait a minute. What gives him the right to bring wrath upon people that have refused his name? Well, between his first coming to Jerusalem and his second coming to the Mount of Olives, a cross stands in the middle. Where indeed, he went all the way through the streets of Jerusalem with a cross beam on his back, and he went to that cross and he died for your sin. He died for those who would come to believe in him. If you've come to believe in him, you've taken advantage of his death. If you haven't, you're lost for all eternity. And since he died for you, he has the authority and the right to judge you for how you've responded to his great cross. So, he's a king who will not lose his honor in judgment. He'll actually do exactly what he should do. So, the story of the king of kings, it's sobering, isn't it? And so the last question we ask is, why does this matter? Well, if you've never met the Lord Jesus Christ and bowed your knee to him, it matters because you only have a certain amount of time to come to the king. That time may end today, when in physical death you meet him, and you've never faced the reality of trusting him as Savior and Lord. Or that time may come in the distant future. But believe me, the time will have been enough for you to know who he is and decide what to do with him. Now, if you never make a decision to trust him as the king, of kings in this life, you will face him in the life to come, in his great throne room of judgment, where you will see him and you will bow your knee to him as the great king of kings 
and then you'll face eternity under his wrath. Decide for Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, today, in the time that he has graciously given you to respond. Now, if you're a believer, you will now face him in a different way. You won't face him as judge in the great white throne room of wrath. You will be led by him and welcomed by him as his beloved into the great eternal city of the king described in Revelation 19 through 22. Oh, that's a different expectation altogether. Because you're now a child of the king. You have the right to be with the king. And he has built a dwelling place for you. And when he comes again as the king of kings and lord of lords, he will lead you into the eternal city. And you will be with him. And he will be your God and king forever and ever. King of kings, who is he to you? God bless you today and God bless you as you walk with him.